Hello everyone. Today our topic of discussion is environmental degradation and invasive species. Save nature for our future. The content of discussion under this topic are environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, climate change, habitat destruction, invasive species, traits of invaded ecosystem, study and eradication. So to start with, what is environmental degradation? Environmental degradation, it is the degradation of the environment through depletion of resources, natural resources such as air, water and soil, the destruction of ecosystems, habitat destruction, the extinction of wildlife and pollution. So it is defined as any change or disturbance to the environment perceived to be deleterious or undesirable. Environmental degradation is one of the 10 threats officially cautioned by the high-level panels on threats, challenges and change of the United Nations. The United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction defines environmental degradation as the reduction of the capacity of the environment to meet social and ecological objectives and needs. So, environmental degradation comes in many types. When natural habitats are destroyed or natural resources are depleted, the environment is degraded. So, efforts to counteract this problem include your environmental protection and environmental resource management. Now, coming to your biodiversity loss so biodiversity loss is the extinction of species species whether they are plant species or the animal species worldwide and also the local reduction loss of species in a certain habitat the latter phenomena can be temporary the loss of species in a certain habitat or permanent on whether it depends on whether the environment degradation that leads to the loss is reversible through ecological restoration, ecological resilience or effectively permanent. For example, through land loss. Global extinction has so far been proven to be irreversible. There is a separate lecture on biodiversity loss in this series of environment lectures. Even though permanent global species loss is a more dramatic phenomena than regional changes in species composition, even the minor changes from a healthy stable state can have dramatic influence on the food web and the food chain so far as reductions in only one species can adversely affect the entire chain. Reduced biodiversity in particular areas leads to reduced ecosystem services and eventually it poses an immediate danger for food security and also here for the humankind. Now coming to the water degradation. One major component of environmental degradation is the depletion of fresh water on earth. Approximately only 2.5 gram percent of all the water on earth is fresh water with the rest being salt water. So this is 2.5 percentage. 69 percent of fresh water is frozen in ice caps located on Antarctica and Greenland. So only 30% of the 2.5% of fresh water is available for consumption. Fresh water is an exceptionally important resource since life on earth is ultimately dependent on it. Water transports nutrients, minerals and chemicals within the biosphere to all forms of life. It sustains both plants and animals and molds the surface of the earth with transportation and deposition of the materials. So the current top three uses of fresh water account for 95% of its consumption. Approximately 85% is used for irrigation of farmland, golf courses and parks. 6% is used for domestic purposes such as indoor bathing, uses outdoor garden and lawn use. 4% is used for industrial purposes such as processing, washing and cooling in manufacturing centers. So, it is estimated that 1 in 3 people over the entire globe are already facing water shortages. Almost one fifth of the world population live in areas of physical water scarcity and almost one quarter of the world's population live in developing country that lacks the necessary infrastructure to use water from available rivers and the aquifers. 
so water scarcity is an increasing problem due to many foreseen issues in the future so the four these foreseen issues are population growth increased urbanization higher standards of living and the climate change now talking about climate change and the temperature climate change affects earth's water supply in large number of ways so it is predicted that the mean global temperature will rise in the coming years due to number of forces affecting the climate the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide will rise and both of these will influence water resources on earth evaporation depends strongly on the temperature and moisture availability which can ultimately affect the amount of water that is available to replenish groundwater supplies now talking about transpiration Transpiration from plants can be affected by a rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide which can decrease their use of water but can also raise their use of water from possible increases of leaf area so the temperature rise can reduce the snow season in the winter and increase the intensity the melting snow leading to peak runoffs affecting soil moisture flood and drought risks and storage capacities depending on the area now talking about climate change and precipitation a rise in global temperature is also predicted to correlate with an increase in global precipitation but because of increased runoff floods increased rates of soil erosion and mass movement of land a decline in water quality is probable because while water will carry more nutrients it will also carry more contaminants so the changes in precipitation they affect the timing and magnitude of floods and droughts shift runoff processes and alter groundwater recharge rates here the vegetation patterns and growth rates will be directly affected by shifts in precipitation amount and distribution which will in turn affect agriculture as well as the natural ecosystem so decreased precipitation will deprive areas of water causing these water tables to fall and reservoirs of wetlands rivers and lakes to empty in addition a possible increase in evaporation and evapotranspiration will result depending on the accompanied rise in the temperature groundwater reserves will be depleted and the remaining water has a greater chance of being of poor quality from saline or contaminants on the land surface next problem here is the population growth the human population on earth is expanding rapidly which goes hand in hand with the degradation of the environment at large measures humanity's appetite for needs is disarranging the environment's natural equilibrium the smoke that is emitted into atmosphere holds detrimental gases such as carbon monoxide and sulfur oxide the available fresh water being affected by climate is also being stretched across an ever increasing global population it is estimated that almost a quarter of global population is living in an area that is using more than 20% of their renewable water supply water use will rise with population while the water supply is also being aggravated by decreases in stream flow and groundwater caused by climate change even though some areas may see an increase in fresh water supply from an uneven distribution of precipitation increase an increased use of water supply is expected population increase over the last two decades at least in the united states has also been accompanied by shift to an increase in urban areas from rural areas which concentrates the demand for water into certain areas and put all the stress on the fresh water supply from industrial and human contaminants next problem is your urbanization also urbanization causes overcrowding and increasingly unsanitary living conditions especially in developing countries which in turn exposes an increasingly number of people to disease about 79% 
of world's population is in developing countries, which lack access to sanitary water and sewer systems, giving rises to disease and deaths from contaminated water and increased number of disease-carrying insects. Now we will talk about agriculture. Agriculture is dependent on available soil moisture, which is directly affected by climate dynamics, with precipitation being input in the system and various processes, for example, surface runoff, evapotranspiration, etc. Change in climate, especially when we talk about changes in precipitation and evapotranspiration predicted by climate models, will directly affect soil moisture, surface runoff, and groundwater recharge. In areas with decreasing precipitation as predicted by the climate models, soil moisture may be substantially reduced. With this in mind, agriculture in most areas already needs irrigation, which depletes fresh water, which depletes fresh water and it supplies both by the physical use of water and the degradation of agriculture causes to water. Now look at the livestock. Cows need water to drink more if the temperature is high and humidity is low and more if the production system of the cow is not extensive since finding food takes more effort. Water is needed in processing of the meat and also in the production of feed for the livestock. Manure can contaminate bodies of fresh water and slaughterhouses depending on how well they are managed, contribute waste such as blood, fat, hair and other bodily contents to supply of fresh water. So there is a need for water management. The issue of depletion of fresh water can be met by increased efforts in water management. While water management systems are often flexible, adaptations to new hydrological conditions may be very costly. Preventative approaches are necessary to avoid high costs of inefficiency and the need of rehabilitation of water supplies. Water supply systems as they exist now were based on the assumptions of the current climate and built to accommodate existing river flows and flood frequencies. Reservoirs are operated based on past hydrological records and irrigation systems on historical temperature, water availability, crop water requirements. These may not be reliable guide for the future. So we have to re-examine everything. Re-examine engineering designs, operations, optimizations, re-evaluating your legal, technical and economic approaches to manage water resources are very important for the future of water management. And another approach is water privatization. Despite its economic and cultural effects, service quality and overall quality of the water can be more easily controlled and distributed. This is just one of the solution. But here we will talk about the environmental issue. Environmental issues are harmful effects of human activity on biophysical environment. Environmental protection is a practice of protecting natural environment on individual, organizational or governmental levels for the benefit of both the environment and humans. Environmentalism, a social and environmental movement, addresses environmental issues through advocacy, education and activism. The carbon dioxide equivalent of greenhouse gas and the atmosphere has already exceeded. Climate disasters are on rise. Around 70% of disasters are now climate related up from 50% from two decades ago. These disasters take a heavier human toll and come with a higher price tag. In the last decade, 2.4 billion people were affected by climate related disasters compared to 1.7 billion in the previous decade. The cost of responding to disasters has risen tenfold. Destructive sudden heavy rains, intense tropical storms, repeated flooding and droughts are likely to increase as will the vulnerability of local communities in the absence of strong concerted action. So next subtopic in this lecture is your habitat destruction. 
Habitat destruction is the process by which natural habitat becomes incapable of supporting its native species. In this process, the organisms that previously used the site are displaced or destroyed, reducing biodiversity. So, habitat destruction by human activity is mainly for the purpose of harvesting natural resources for your industrial production and urbanization. Clearing habitats for agriculture is the principal cause of habitat destruction. Other important causes of habitat destruction, they include mining, logging, trawling, urban sprawl. Habitat destruction is currently ranked as a primary cause of species extinction worldwide. It is the process of natural environmental change that may be caused by habitat fragmentation and the climate change or by human activities such as introduction of invasive species. We will discuss about invasive species in detail in this lecture only. So, the terms habitat loss and habitat reduction are also used in wider sense including your loss of habitat from other factors such as water and noise pollution also. Now, what is the impact of habitat destruction on the organisms? In the simplest term, when a habitat is destroyed, the plants, animals and other organisms that occupied the habitat have reduced carrying capacity so that populations decline and extinction becomes more likely. Perhaps the greatest threat to organisms and biodiversity is the process of habitat loss. Scientists found that 82% of endangered bird species were significantly threatened by habitat loss. Most amphibian species are also threatened by habitat loss and some species are now only breeding in modified habitat. Endemic organism with limited ranges are most affected by habitat destruction mainly because these organisms are not found anywhere else in the world and thus have less chance of recovering. Many endemic organisms have very specific requirements for their survival that can only be found with a certain ecosystem resulting in their extinction. So extinction may also take place very long after the destruction of habitat, a phenomena known as extinction debt. Habitat destruction can also decrease the range of certain organism populations. This can result in the reduction of genetic diversity and perhaps the production of infertile youths as these organisms would have higher possibility of mating with related organisms within their population or different species. One of the most famous examples is the impact upon China's giant panda once found across the nation. Now it is only found in fragmented and isolated regions in the southwest of the country as a result of widespread deforestation in the 20th century. Now taking a look on the geography, biodiversity hotspots are chiefly tropical regions that feature high concentration of endemic species when all hotspots are combined may contain over half of the world's tertial species. Regions of unsustainable agriculture or unstable governments which may go hand in hand typically experience high rates of habitat destruction. Central America, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Amazonian tropical rainforest areas of South America are the main regions with unsustainable agricultural practices or government mismanagement. Areas of high agricultural output tend to have the highest extent of habitat destruction. In US, less than 25% of native vegetation remains in many parts of East and Midwest. Only 15% of land area remains unmodified by human activities in all of Europe. Now taking a look on the ecosystems, tropical rainforests have received most of the attention concerning the destruction of the habitat. From approximately 16 million square kilometers of tropical rainforest habitat that originally existed worldwide, less than 9 million square kilometers remain today. The current rate of deforestation is 1,60,000 square kilometers per year, which equates to a loss of approximately 1% of original forest 
habitat each year. Other forest ecosystems have suffered as much more destruction as tropical rainforest. Farming and logging have severely distru- disturbed at least 94% of temperate broadleaf forest. Many old growth forest stands have lost more than 98% of their previous area because of human activities. Tropical deciduous dry forests are easier to clear and burn and are more suitable for agriculture and cattle ranching. Plains and desert areas have been degraded to a lesser extent. Only 10 to 20 percent of world's drylands, which include temperate grasslands, have been somewhat degraded. But included in that 10 to 20 percent of land is approximately 9 million square kilometers seasonally, those of which humans have converted to deserts through the process of desertification. Talking about wetlands and marine areas, they have endured high levels of habitat destruction. More than 50% of wetlands in US have been destroyed in just 200 years. Between 60% and 70% of European wetlands have been completely destroyed. In the UK, there has been increase in demand of coastal housing and tourism, which has caused a decline in marine habitats over the last 60 years. The rising sea levels and temperatures have caused soil erosion, coastal flooding and loss of quality in the UK marine ecosystem. About one-fifth, that is around 20% of marine coastal areas have been highly modified by humans. One-fifth of coral reefs have also been destroyed. And another fifth has been severely degraded by overfishing pollution and invasive species. 90% of Philippines coral reefs alone have been destroyed. Finally, over 35% of mangrove ecosystems worldwide have been destroyed. Now, there are two kind of causes behind these. First is your natural causes. Habitat destruction through natural processes such as volcanism, fire and climate change is well documented in the fossil record and we have discussed this in the various lectures in this series. Next are your human causes. Habitat destruction caused by humans include your land conversion from forest to arable land, urban sprawl, etc. Habitat degradation, fragmentation and pollution are aspects of habitat destruction which is caused by humans that do not necessarily involve over destruction of habitat. Now what is the impact of all this on the human population? Habitat destruction vastly increases an area's vulnerability to natural disasters like flood, drought, crop failure, spread of disease, water contamination. On the other hand, a healthy ecosystem with good management practices will reduce the chance of these events happening or will at least mitigate adverse impacts. The negative impacts of habitat destruction usually impact your rural populations more directly than the urban populations. Across the globe, poor people suffer the most when natural habitat is destroyed because less natural habitat means fewer natural resources per capita. Yet, wealthier people and countries simply have to pay more to continue to receive more than their per capita share of natural resources. Another way to view the negative effects of habitat destruction is to look at the opportunity cost of destroying a given habitat. In other words, what are people losing out on by taking away a given habitat? A country may increase its food supply by converting forest land to row crop agriculture, but such as clean water, timber, ecotourism, or flood regulation and drought control. Now the third subtopic of this lecture is your invasive species that we will discuss in detail. Invasive species is a species that is not native to a specific location. So it is an introduced species. It has been introduced A is known as invasive species. Invasion of long established ecosystem by organisms from distant bioregions is a natural phenomena which has likely been accelerated via hominid assisted migration although this has not been adequately directly measured. Now, the criteria for invasive species has been controversial. As widely divergent perceptions exist among researchers as well as concerns with the subjectivity of the term invasive. Several alternate usages 
terms have been proposed the term as most often used applied to introduced species non indigenous species non native species that adversely affect the habitats and bioregions they invade economically environmentally or ecologically such invasive species may be either plants or animals and may disrupt by dominating a region wilderness areas particular habitats or wild land urban interface invasion of long established ecosystems by organisms from distant by regions is a natural phenomenon which has likely been accelerated via your humanid assisted migration now what are the causes of this introduction of species into no new area so first is your species based mechanisms are there and another is your ecosystem based mechanism firstly we'll talk about the species based mechanisms while all species compete to survive invasive species appear to have specific traits or specific combinations of traits that allow them to outcompete native species in some cases the competition is about rates of growth and reproduction in other cases species interact with each other more directly The researchers totally disagree about the usefulness of traits as invasiveness markers. One study found that of a list of invasive and non-invasive species, 86% of invasive species could be identified from the traits alone. Another study found invasive species tended to have only a small subset of presumed traits and that many similar traits were found in non-invasive species requiring other explanations so common invasive species traits include the following their fast growth rapid reproduction high dispersal ability phenotype plasticity the ability to alter growth from the suit current conditions to suit the current conditions tolerance of a wide range of environmental conditions ability to live off a wide range of food type association with humans prior successful invasions so these in invasive species might alter their environment by releasing chemical compounds modifying abiotic factors or affecting behavior of the herbivores now another cause is your ecosystem based, me based mechanisms in ecosystems the amount of available resources and the extent to which those resources are used by organism determines the effects of additional species on the ecosystem in stable ecosystem the equilibrium exists in the use of available resources these mechanisms describe a situation in which ecosystem has suffered a disturbance which changes the fundamental nature of the ecosystem when changes such as forest fire occur normal succession favors native grasses and forbs and introduced species that can spread faster than natives can use resources that would have been available to native species squeezing them out nitrogen and phosphorus are often the limiting factors in these situations so every species occupies a niche in its native ecosystem some species fill large and varied roles while others are highly specialized see these words habitat and niche i have explained in my first lecture but once again i'll tell you this is the home of an organism this is the profession of an organism in an ecosystem niche is the profession habitat is your home for the organism some invading species fill niches that are not used by native species and they also create new niches ecosystem changes can alter species distributions also one interesting finding in studies of invasive species has shown that introduced populations have great potential for rapid adaptation and that is used to explain how many introduced species are able to establish and become invasive in new environments rapid adaptive evolution in these species leads to offsprings that have higher fitness and are better suited for their environment this in addition to evolution that takes place after introduction all determine if the species will be able to become established in the new ecosystem and if it will reproduce and thrive now traits of the invaded ecosystems where the invasive species have finally invaded invasion was more like an 
likely an ecosystem that was similar to the one in which potential invader evolved island ecosystems may be more prone to invasion because of their species faced few strong competitors and predators or because they are distant from colonizing species population an example of this phenomena was the decimation of native bird population guam by the invasive brown tree snake conversely invaded ecosystem may lack the natural competitors and predators that check invasive growth in their native ecosystems invaded ecosystems may have experienced disturbance typically human induced such a disturbance may give invasive species a chance to establish themselves with less competition from natives less able to adapt to disturbed ecosystem now coming to vectors non native species have many vectors including biogenic vectors but most invasions are associated with the human activity An early human vector occurred when prehistoric humans introduced the Pacific rat. So this was introduced in Polynesia in prehistoric times. Vectors include plants or seeds imported for horticulture, the pet trade move animals across borders, the arrival of invasive propagules to a new site is a function of site's invisibility. Many invasive species once they are dominant in the area are essential to the ecosystem of that area if they are removed from the location it could be harmful to that area even economics plays a major role in exotic species introduction high demand of valuable chinese mitten crab is one explanation for the possible intentional release of species in foreign waters now talking about the aquatic environment within the aquatic environment the development of maritime trade has rapidly affected the way marine organisms are transported within the ocean many marine organisms have the capacity to attach themselves to vessel hulls therefore these organisms are easily transported from one body of water to another and are significant risk factor to biological invasion event unfortunately controlling for vessel hull fouling is voluntary and there are no regulations currently in place to manage hull fouling however the governments of california and new zealand have announced more stringent control for vessel hull fouling within their respective jurisdictions The other main vector for the transport is non-native aquatic species as ballast water. Now ballast water taken up at sea and released in port by transoceanic vessels is largest vector for non-native aquatic species. Even though ballast water regulations are in place to protect against potentially invasive species, there exists a loophole for organisms in the very for the micron size like 10 to 15 micron size how will you stop them another important factor to consider about marine invasive species is the role of environmental changes also which is associated with the climate change such as increase in ocean temperature there have been multiple studies suggesting an increase in ocean temperature will cause range shifts in organisms which could have detrimental effects on the environment as new species interactions emerge due to the complexity of climate change induced variation it is difficult to predict the nature of temperature based success of non native species since Some studies have suggested that increased temperature tolerance of hijackers on ship hulls or in ballast water it is necessary to develop more comprehensive fouling and ballast water management plans in an effort to prevent against future possible invasions as environmental conditions continue to change around the world now the wildfire and the firefighting invasive species often exploit disturbances to an ecosystem to colonize an area large wildfires can sterilize soils while adding a variety of nutrients in the resulting free for all formerly entrenched species lose their advantage leaving more ro- room for the invasives wildfires often occur in remote areas needing fire suppression crews to travel through pristine forest to reach the site Fire suppression vehicles are often major culprits in such outbreaks as the vehicles are often driven on back roads overgrown with invasive plant species. The undercarriage of the vehicle becomes a prime vessel of transport.
In response, in large fires, washing stations decontaminate vehicles before engaging in suppression activities. Large wildfires attract firefighters from remote places, further increasing the potential for seed transport. Now, what are the effects? So, firstly, talking about the health, encroachment of humans into previously remote ecosystems has exposed exotic diseases such as HIV to the wider population, introduced birds, pigeons, rodents and insects like mosquitoes, flea, cc fly pests can serve as vectors and reservoirs for human afflictions. Throughout recorded history, epidemics of human diseases such as malaria, yellow fever, typhus, spread via these vectors. A recent example of an introduced disease is the spread of West Nile virus, which killed human birds, mammals and reptiles. The introduced Chinese mitten crabs are carriers of Asian lung fluke. Waterborne diseases agents such as cholera bacteria, Vibrio cholerae and causative agents of harmful algal blooms are often transported via ballast waters. Invasive species and accompanying control efforts can have long-term public health implications. For instance, your pesticides applied to treat a particular pest species could pollute soil and surface water. Then, on your biodiversity, effect on the biodiversity, biotic invasion is considered one of the five top drivers for global biodiversity loss and is increasing because of tourism and globalization. Another effect is your genetic pollution. Native species can be threatened with extinction through the process of genetic pollution. Genetic pollution is unintentional hybridization and introgression which leads to homogenization or replacement of local genotypes as a result of either a numerical or fitness advantage to the introduced species. So hybrids resulting from invasive species interbreeding with native species can incorporate their genotypes into the gene pool over the time through introgression. Then invasive exotic diseases could take place. History is rife with the spread of exotic diseases such as introduction of smallpox into indigenous peoples of Americas by Spanish where it is obliterated entire populations of indigenous civilization because they were ever even seen Europeans. So there was no immunization in the native population. Another example is Dutch elm disease which has severely reduced the American elm trees in forests and the cities. But in recent years some argue that some introduced species have a positive ecological impact on environment also. So therefore, we need to study a lot to eradicate the negative effects. While the study of invasive species can be done within many subfields of biology, the majority of research on invasive organism has been within the field of your ecology and geography, where the issue of biological invasions is especially important. By discarding taxonomy, human health and economic factors, the model focused on an ecological factors. Research should focus on the ecological factors. Research should evaluate individual populations rather than the entire species. So it classified each population based on its success in that environment. This way, this model applied equally to indigenous and to introduced species and it can automatically categorize successful introductions as harmful so this is all about today's lecture if you have any queries you can comment in the comment section thank you hello everyone.